This year's Board and Yarn Lecture, and again this is our 12th annual, is Ann Bremner. She's a freelance editor, writer, and arts professional based here in Columbus, Ohio. Anne met Erica Borgnon in 1989 when she was invited to assist with an exhibition of Paul Henri Borgnon's work at Catholic University's Schumacher Gallery. She also assisted with planning for subsequent exhibitions of the artist's work at Ohio Wesleyan University's Ross Art Museum and the Columbus Museum, Museum of Art last year and authored the lead essay for the catalog accompanying the Columbus Museum presentation. Her lecture tonight is entitled, The Artist and the Anthropologist, Paul Henri Bourguignon and Erica Bourguignon. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Anne Bremner to the podium. I want to add uh, my thanks as well to particularly Jane Hoffelt, um, who was, uh, is also Sort of, I'm Erica's in-house editor. Jane is her in-house graphic designer, and I copped some of the comparisons that I'm using in the lecture tonight from her design for the Columbus Museum of Art exhibition. And I also want to thank um, Lisa Yacobellis and the Knowledge Bank folks at the OSU Library who have wonderful, wonderful online presence for. Um, Paul Bourguignon's amazing photographs, and some by Erica as well, taken in Haiti and um, also by Paul in Peru, which are a lot of what you're going to be seeing tonight. Not everything, but, but a lot of it. Um, I have to tell you, I've already told this story once. As recently as last spring and last summer, when we were working on the catalog for the Columbus Museum exhibition that opened this fall and was up until January, um, Erica was telling me not to talk about her. I had mentioned in my essay for the catalog that she had been, uh, I think I gave her exact dates of coming to the department and I said she had been the chair and she said, oh, that's too much about me, take it out, take it out. But when she had suggested to Clark that I might give the lecture, the Bourguignon lecture this year and talk about Paul's work, and we were tossing around ideas for a title, it was Erica who said, how about the artist and the anthropologist? And I said, well, that sounds great, but you realize that means I get to talk about you. And she said, well, I think that will be fine. And so uh, starting sort of as soon as we were done with the plans and had the Columbus Ex Museum exhibition open, uh, we kept on meeting regularly as we had been doing, but instead of me picking her brain about Paul, I was getting her stories. And that's a lot of what you're going to be hearing tonight. Um, I also said, have said to people before, though, you know, those of you who've heard me speak about Paul in conjunction with the Columbus Museum show will hear some things and see some things you've seen before. Um, those of you who were Erica's students, her colleagues, served on committees with her, you'll probably also hear a lot of things that you may have heard before, but I hope that there's enough sort of crossover and overlap and difference between the two that there'll be something that's at least a little bit new for everybody. Um, so oh, can we get the lights down a little bit so that you can see the images? They can go back up when I'm done, but I want, I want you to be able to see. How about the stage lights? Can you see? Can you see how beautiful? OK, so um, this is, as, as you, I think, probably most of you know. Uh, oh, and this is the Erica Bourguignon Memorial Laser Pointer. Because in critiquing my two presentations at the Columbus Museum, she said, Anne, you should use a laser pointer. So I made sure that we got one. So, Here's Paul, and here's Erica. <laughs> um, so, and, and they are our artist and our anthropologist. 
And uh, a, this is a picture that was taken in Columbus, in their home in Columbus, in uh, I think probably the 1950s or 60s. Um, they, they look so happy and companionable. And you'll see in many of the photographs of Erica taken by Paul, she looks like she's laughing or she's trying not to laugh. And Erica, um, Jane and I think that he must have just told her something funny. And I think that um, sort of mutu mutuality, any of you who were ever in any of their homes, I think immediately you see these are two people that had a lot of interests and a lot of curiosities in common. And uh, their homes, their home on North Broadway is filled with art, filled with anthropological artifacts and artworks, and you know where the line goes there is hard to say. Um, and these are things that they both loved, and uh, and that meant very much to both of them in in their lives and in their work, as I think we'll see. Okay, so. Um, Paul and Erica met in Haiti in 1947 where she, when she went there to do her field work for her PhD dissertation in anthropology and Paul was already there. She was becoming an anthropologist. He was already an artist. He'd already had an art career and I just want to show you real quickly a couple of his works from the 1920s and the 1930s. This one, Couple, and, uh, Couple with Dog, which made its um, American debut in the Columbus Museum show because it was found behind another painting when Erica got it reframed. So it was one of the paintings that Paul had always kept with him and brought to Columbus with him, but it had never been seen or shown before. And it has most of the things that I love about his work. It has a great sense of color. It has, um, it uses very simple and minimal means, just a little bit of a buzz of a line here or there or a patch of color to convey what's going on. And it has a great sense of humor. And I think it's, it's you know, I, and you gotta love that dog. Um, and uh, so, there's that. Um, another one of his early paintings from the 1920s. This one is an image that was painted on site looking out from a hotel room in Marseille, France over the uh, old harbor area. And I think these two images kind of give you a sense of where Paul started as an artist. He studied art as a teenager. He had some pretty heavy duty um, Belgian Academy um, professors who were his teachers and they taught him to, to make art in what's pretty much a, a post-impressionist impressionist inspired style on site out in nature um, accepting some degree of liberation from painting exactly what was in front of him but beginning with what was right in front of him like in, in this view, and that changes as he goes on. He had his first show as an artist when he was only 22, and it was very successful. It sold out, or almost sold out, but it's, so it's maybe kind of surprising that he didn't really go on then as a professional artist. He uh, studied art history. Uh, this is a painting by Paul, of St. Paul, um, from, 19, from the 1930s, uh, when Paul was actually studying art history and writing, doing his graduate work on the Spanish painter El Greco. And I think there's a bit of El Greco in the eyes here that you can see. And again, he is doing some simpl simplifying stylization. Uh, Paul then went on to work in what we would now think of as sort of PR work. He um, was, for a time, the assistant to the Consul General for Haiti in Brussels, Belgium, which is um, an important thing that will come up later. Uh, and he then worked f for the Belgium and Luxembourg tourist um, promotion, you know, sort of promotional wing, and traveled all, all around. 
um, and did paintings and took some sort of snapshotty uh, photographs as he went. This is a picture of Rome. Um, and again, you can see this sort of geometric simplification of the Colosseum and one of the arches. I think, I didn't say, he was born in 1906 in Brussels. Um, his parents were um, pretty well off, comfortably off people. He, uh, he had a dual heritage of, uh, his uh, mother was a uh, Flemish speaker and his father was a French speaker. So both sides of that sort of uh, Brussels and Belgium divide. He was brought up as a Catholic. Um, and he painted St. Paul, he painted a lot of religious images, but after the First World War, which he experienced as a child, and he remembered, um, told Erica that he remembered being so disillusioned when he found out that the bishops on both sides had blessed the troops and assured everyone that you know God was on their side, and so he, he believed in sort of the humanistic stories of the Bible, um, but, but was not a deeply relig religious man. Um, Erica was uh, born in 1920, now I've got to check my notes, 1924 in Vienna. And her family, her mother was a doctor. They were very, they were secularized Jews. Her mother was a doctor. Her father was a businessman. Um, they lived around the corner from Sigmund Freud in Vienna. How's that for a neighborhood? And a, a starting point for a woman who became known for her contributions to psychological anthropology. Um, they left Vienna right at the time of uh, the takeover by the Nazis. Um, Erica was a schoolgirl. She had been attending the Jewish college preparatory high uh, school, secondary school in Vienna, and she was sent off to boarding school in, um, uh, in Switzerland until her parents could get a visa, and they were also, they got out of Austria and spent time in both Belgium and in Switzerland until they could get a visa to come to the United States. They um, settled in New York. Erica went to school there. She said she was concerned about her parents. She remembers arriving in New York as a time of great anxiety and she was concerned about her parents. They both had kind of been separated from their profession. Her mother was not working as a doctor anymore, and I don't think ever did again after coming to this country. Her father had lost sort of his, um, the status of his business life. Um, she was concerned about them. She was concerned about being seen as a refugee. She was worried about the members of their Jewish family that had been left behind in Europe. Um, so it was, it was a, a, not an easy transition for her and, it was, and that uneasiness, that sense of uneasiness stayed with her about that initial transition to this country. But she went to um, Queens College and she had anthropology courses with a woman named Hortense Powdermaker, who was another secularized Jew, and the anthropologist among you might recognize her name as one of the you know, leading early anthropologists. She did her work at the London School of Economics, and although she had done field work in one of the so-called primitive societies in uh, in uh, Oceania, I think. She also went on to do field work in Mississippi and was sort of a pioneer in bringing the anthropological um, perspective to w contemporary people, in, in this case specifically African Americans in, in Mississippi, and to look at that, uh, to look at their experiences, not as something primitive, but as something worthy of study. Um, Erica w found in Powdermaker a, a, a real mentor, and uh, 
was inspired to go on in anthropology. She remembers doing a seminar with Powdermaker where they were to, to study minorities. And she said, you know, and in those days, minorities in New York would be like Italians. And I, and I said, well, so what did you do? How did you, what did you, what did you do? And I was envisioning hearing about going and meeting people or conducting interviews. And she said, we went to the library and got out books. Um, so that was, a, that was a beginning, but by the time she had got her bachelor's degree and was, uh, had spent a little bit of time as a teaching assistant working at the University of Connecticut, she was ready to go to um, Northwestern where she, did her, where she got her PhD and she was eager to go there to work with two more leading early American anthropologists, a guy named A.I. known as Pete Hallowell and a guy named Melville Her uh, Hersh Herskovitz. Is that right? Herskovitz. Herskovitz. Okay, and um, Hallowell had done his background at the University of um, Pennsylvania and he was at uh, Northwestern just briefly before leaving there. And he, I think, had, um, had done work with Native Americans and it was under his tutelage that Erica did some uh, field work at a Chippewa reservation in um, Wisconsin. He was interested in some sort of psychological aspects. It was under his tutelage that she was encouraged to learn how to work with uh, Rorschach tests, with ink blocks tests and see what you could glean from people um, by getting their responses to that. And maybe, unfortunately, maybe not, very shortly after she got to Northwestern, he went back to Pennsylvania. And so she was left with, um, say it for me, Hershkovitz. Hershkovitz. Um, who I think was less interested in the inkblot test. She, she administered them and had very careful notes on them and she said that when she brought the ones that she had done Haiti back in Haiti back, he just wasn't interested at all. And she told me, and this is the one thing I'm going to say that she said, oh, you can't say that to anthropologists. Um, she, she said that he embraced a kind of vacuum cleaner approach to anthropology and field work. Um, and the, the idea was that you found out as much as you could about anything that you could, and, and then you sort of started sorting out what it might mean. And she said, oh, you can't say that to them. And I said, well, it's history. It's not saying that's what they do now. It's, it's history. But so that was kind of the mindset in which she went off to Haiti. And uh, it was Herskovitz who had previously done work in Haiti and thought that she would be a good pe person to go. He had a grant for somebody to go and study. And he thought she should go because she spoke French. So that set up her, her going there. And Paul, now we'll go back to Paul. That's Erica, of course, on the far side, and Paul here. And here they are both walking through sugarcane fields in Haiti in one of the areas where she did her field work. He had just been through, she had been in New York. He had just been through World War II in Europe and had lived um, under the Nazi occupation in Brussels, um, had gotten a job in doing, uh, distributing ration coupons to foreign travelers. Um, but it must have been a very sort of insecure time to be, to, to be there. He had actually been part of, of um, Belgium and had tried to stay neutral when the Nazis invaded all military age, able-bodied men were ordered to, to go try to find the French army and join up. And uh, some of them got there and got evacuated and um, fought with the Allies, but an awful lot of them got 
you know, didn't get to where the French army, where the front was, and ended up, the group Paul was with ended up just going back to, to Brussels and, and spending the time there. Um, I asked her a lot when we were talking about Paul about his going to Haiti and his leaving Europe and, you know, what was he, what was he thinking, what was he interested in? Because right in the, the, the days immediately following um, the liberation of Brussels, it was a really exciting time culturally in, in um, Brussels and Paul was really sort of plunging back in to artwork and not making artwork but being an art critic for one of the daily newspapers. He ran a gallery, he collaborated with a number of, of prominent Belgian artists on different projects and um, he, you know, it was just, it was a really exciting time. And she told me, and I later found passages in his novel, The Greener Grass, where he puts very similar words into the, um, vo the voice of his narrator and sort of alter ego, ego, that there really wasn't, you know, that it was scary in Europe. And Europe was a shambles, and there didn't really seem to be much prospect for him or for many other people, except maybe yet another war, maybe this time with the Russians. And so when his, his old friend, the former consul general for Haiti in Brussels, wrote to him and invited him to come to Haiti, and told him, this is in the voice in the story, the character in the, in the novel, he said, oh, you'll find lots to write about and lots to paint. Um, and it's French speaking, so, you know, you'll get along fine. So he, it's, it seemed like a good idea. So he was there as well. So here they are, the artist, or the, the former and future artist, and the budding anthropologist in the sugar fields of Haiti. I wanted to just show you with the handy dandy laser pointer where Erica actually worked, where they both went in Haiti. It's all very, really pretty close to Port-au-Prince. Okay, so can, do we have a little dot? So here's Port-au-Prince. There were two main places that Erica went outside of Port-au-Prince. One was an area called Brock, which was west of Port-au-Prince, See, can I, where's my dot? There it is. It's right on this bump. And it's actually an area where there was, it's uh, kind of plains, and it was sugar growing area, and that's where the photos we just saw were. And it's actually very close to where the epicenter of the 2010 um, earthquake was. So um, not much that she probably saw is still the way that it was. And then she also went later into an area that was up in the mountains where they grew corn and coffee. And that's where I'm going to try to put the pointer next. All right, right about, right about there, a little, a little village called First Sea. And in both of these places, she started being the vacuum cleaner. Um, she took incredibly detailed notes on anything and everything. Patterns of, you know, what relationships and families, class hierarchy, food, cooking, um, plants, animals, uh, child rearing, dreams, um, rituals. And many of her original notes are still in the house. Um, and some of them, I think, w were partly the source material that she and Jane used for the notes that accompany the Haitian photographs in the, in the Knowledge Bank. They met at the Hotel Excel, uh, uh, what is it, the Hotel E, I always call it the Hotel E, Hotel, Ruthie, what's the name of your paint? Excelsior, thank you, which was not it was a sort of guest house that was primarily frequented by Haitians, but it was a place where 
um, a graduate student on a modest budget and a um, artist who had artist and but and photographer who had something of a little official standing as a foreign correspondent for one of the Belgian newspapers. He could send them occasional reports on things. Um, but you know he was didn't have a lot of money either, but it was a place where they could afford to stay and stay for quite a while. Um, there's a balcony right here. And I think that was one of Erica's sort of regular rooms because there are photographs, although I actually don't have any of the photographs in that room and from that room with me. But that's, I, she, her room had a balcony. Here are Erica again in Paul's photographs after they had met at the hotel um, with a woman who was very important for her studies um, or her field work in Haiti, a woman named Antoinette. And Antoinette is the woman that you see in the painting in her room that we've been using for the publicity for this. Antoinette was um, one of, I don't know whether you call them sources or informants, one of the people that was sort of Erica's points of entree into Haitian society. And it was with Antoinette that she went to stay in the sugar growing area in a house that belonged to some branch of Antoinette's family. And Erica made a modest um, contribution towards getting the little shack, made a little bit less shacky and getting a latrine put in. Um, and, and then they went up there together and she began her, her vacuum cleanering. According to Erica, when, what, one of the things that really impressed Paul when he came to Haiti was the huge crowds of people and the bustle, a very different bustle from the bustle of um, the European cities that he had known. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things that you see again and again in his photographs and then later in his paintings are women going to markets in their white dresses, with often with big bundles on their heads. And you know, this is something that clearly interested him. The same images and sort of the same experience was something that Erica report, you know, used in her reports on her fieldwork and her later writing and, and articles to talk about sort of the role of women in the economy and how by do, doing some baking or doing some sewing or um, bringing in fruit that they had raised, women were able to establish a little bit of um, economic independence and, and uh, a little bit of, of um, financial support for themselves. So here's just that. Just Paul um, wasn't painting in Haiti. And when I show you paintings of Haiti, they're all ones that were done right here in Columbus after he got here, um, between the 19, uh, 1950s and the 1980s. But he was getting more and more serious about his photography. And I just grabbed this one. It's just a view of Port-au-Prince and its harbor from a hillside. But I just grabbed it because it's got crop marks. You know, so you can see he's beginning to think about his photography not just as snapshot taking, but as something that has sort of more of a impact. Um, this is a, another one of his photos that Erica used in, in her re, in you know in her publications as well. It's often called the slum and the palace, and it's a view of the Haitian presidential palace, that glowing white uh, building in the distance. Um, but from very much a, oops, wrong one, from very much a sort of slum street with that little boy lurking in the, door, in the doorway. In Haiti, Paul was doing a lot of different things while she was doing her research. He was meeting with artists. This is actually a, a, a pretty distinguished um, Haitian artist named Hector, where do I have his name? Hippolyte. Hippolyte, yes indeed, that's right, Hector Hippolyte, who had actually been discovered 
by the French art critic André Breton, who spent the war years in um, this side of the world, and he had gone to Haiti, and he had found and bought some of Hippolyte's paintings. Um, and uh, Hippolyte was one of a number of Haitian artists who were kind of a renaissance of self-taught or folk art, who used very, very vivid colors, um, often voodoo-influenced subject matter. This is a, a voodoo figure. Um, and whose work was embraced by these European modernists like André Breton to, um, you know, as kind of signposts for, for modernism. Um, Paul also knew this guy, whose name is Wilson um, Bogard, and this is again a voodoo type scene and with really beautiful, beautiful, vivid colors. This painting has lived in Erica's study, I think, since they got back to um, the, since either she got here or Paul got here. Um, and he did some writing about these self taught Haitian artists. And, uh, also got himself into a little bit of controversy because while some Americans and some Europeans really embraced these artists and saw in them aspects of um, art that would be important for modernism, like the, the flatness of this image, the way the, the space is really flattened and the images are sort of displayed on, deployed, deployed around as if on a flat surface. And also, this is an image of a voodoo ritual, but there are different scenes that take place at different times simultaneously in the image. And, you know, something that from a very different direction the Cubists had been doing um, a couple decades earlier in, um, in art in France and something that Paul eventually was interested in doing that kind of simultaneity himself and he saw it here in the work of, um, of the Cuban painter. He also renewed acquaintances with his old friend the council who is the center man here, this guy. And, he's, and here's Paul lurking in his bow tie back here and uh, his friend was going back to Europe on another diplomatic um, mission. Um, but he, before he left, uh, with all this gang of guys seeing him off, had you know, sort of helped Paul make a variety of, of contacts in Haiti among writers and journalists and people that he could sort of hang out with in um, a cafe, as we will see eventually. So, but increasingly, so those are some of the things that Paul was doing, but increasingly he was hanging out with Erica, and here she is laughing again as he takes her picture. And I, they traveled, I mean, he came to visit her in both of the, the smaller areas. They took a trip together across um, an, uh, the, the lower peninsula of, of Haiti. Um, they, you know, he was hanging around while she was doing her work. So what was she doing besides taking notes? Well, she did some, some inkblot tests with people, maybe speakers of different languages, because there would be French speakers, there would be Creole speakers, there wasn't really a very um, thorough written uh, grammar or uh, study of the Creole language, but she would see, you know, she used the inkblot tests to sort of gather some information about differences in the responses of the different kind of speakers. She did a lot of work with children's drawings, and she had a stack of them in her office until the day she died, two of them propped up on her desk. Um, we have a donkey, and you can see what the donkey's doing, and that was one that she always kept close to her and thought was interesting. Um, she had um, images, you know, the kids, I don't know what she told the kids to do. Draw what's important to you is what she sort of said to me. 
And some would draw a plant, some would draw animals, some of them would draw a donkey. This is one that she actually had propped up on her desk. And I looked at it and looked at it and I thought, is that some sort of a weird rabbit? And then she said, look at it on the side. And can you turn your head to the side and you can see that it looks like a bus, right? And, and she told me about these incredible old trucks that were being turned into buses. I'm going to just move along. Uh, these are two pictures, one Erica took, one Paul took, of a tailor shop. She, uh, this is her house in Fur Sea. Um, and Paul at her house in Fur Sea. I had sort of gotten the idea, and this is her, oh, this is the house in Fursey. That's the one in Brock, sorry. This is Fursey with the metal roof. Children, another little girl with a basket on her head. I had asked her, I thought maybe she had asked Paul to take photographs of certain things for her. Oh, I need pictures of markets. I need pictures of children. I need pictures of um, voodoo. Um, but she said, no, not really. She just kind of, he sort of took pictures of whatever he wanted, and she found out as much as she could as about as many different things as she could. And then eventually she started seeing how, as she was doing, you know, sort of doing her follow-up to the gathering of the research after she got back to... Columbus, she began seeing how his images could illustrate the points that she was wanting to make. Um, they both evidently had interests in the voodoo um, practices, and she bought a set of voodoo drums, and as part of that process, the drums needed to be baptized, and so she invited him up to First Sea to, I think in that case, in part because maybe he could photograph the process of the baptism of the drums. And these are just two images from a long sequence in the Knowledge Bank about that baptism of the drums. Um, but part of it involved covering them with white flour, and then the chickens were around, and the chickens could peck at the flour. The photograph on the far side is a photo that Erica took herself at a voodoo ritual of some uh, women dressed as Gede spirits. Um, so, and that would have been a time when Paul wasn't there. So she was also doing some photographic documentation herself. This, the, the guy, See, the problem with doing this is you have to know how to work it, and I don't. Uh, but this guy was a well-known voodoo priest um, on the edges of uh, sort of the outskirts of Port-au-Prince that they both went to meet and to talk to. Um, this was a, another um, a, a voodoo priestess uh, who, they, who she, Erica talked with, and they you know, got spent a little bit of time with, and she was, according to both of their recollections, very happy to have her picture taken, and she showed up back in Columbus in one of Paul's drawings. Carnival, um, and this is a, a, a young man in Carnival who turned up in Erica's uh, textbook on psychological anthropology, wearing his mask of, made out of fruit rinds, of grapefruit rinds and other pieces of fruit. And I think there is this interest in Paul in um, masks and masks as something that then influenced his art and the way he could convey, show people and their, their expressions and their feelings in art, while for her, um, both carnival and, and particularly the voodoo practices became part of her long, long-standing uh, research into trance states and disassociated states and um, change, you know, changes in consciousness that became such a significant part of her work. 
Um, these are, this is another one of Paul's Haitian photos, this time of, um, of some tombs that turned up in her psychological anthropology book and in, in other places where um, they, they, these roadside shrines weren't seen very often in Haiti. Um, and she interpreted them as coming in areas that were more prosperous. In the psychological anthropology book, she used this as evidence to talk about how ancestor worship was more important in um, uh, sedentary societies than in nomadic ones. And then always the markets. And I just want to show you, Paul, she went back to, to Columbus. He went on to Peru, and in Peru, he picked up painting again um, and did an oil painting, did a painting for the first time in a long, long time. When he came back to Columbus, or here she is back in Columbus, when she came back to Columbus, she went full bore into her work as a anthropologist. She finished her dissertation, she got her degree, she got a job even before that, coming to teach at Ohio State as an instructor in 1949. She eventually became a full professor. She was the chair of the department, the first chair, um, of the first woman chair of a department in what was then the um, Department of Mathematical and Physical Sciences. Um, but her research in Haiti was always kind of a touchstone for her. Um, one, you know, she, it was a, a foundation for her long time, multi-year collaborative study, sort of a, 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 an international survey, a cross-cultural survey of study of disassociated states. It, came, it fed her work on women which became you know, an increasingly large part of her research and her writing um, in the 1970s and 1980s. And it just constantly sort of the things that she learned there kept coming back as, as her kind of touchstones. For Paul as well, in, oh, I was just gonna, I'm not gonna talk about that. He began painting again, okay? And he painted, he painted, this is Ghent. In, in Belgium in kind of a Cubist style um, in the 1950s. He, I think, you know, my sort of standard line is that he worked through the development of modern art to get to his own individual style. Um, and for him too, this is his very, a very Matisse one, but for him too, Haiti was incredibly important. And his images come back again and again to Haiti. And many of them are based on some of the photographs. He revisits the women from the markets. He revisits the markets themselves. Jane and I think it's interesting, we both have remarked on this independently, that his images of Haiti show much more action and much more of people doing things and people engaged with things than his images, any of his other images. And I think that's partly a function of this kind of mutuality of curiosity that he and Erica shared in finding out everything they could about this culture. And it's partly probably just a, 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 a function of him being there for a longer time. He revisited the presidential palace, the slum streets, some of the figures. And finally we get to the, the painting that I sort of chose as a touchstone for this talk in her room, which actually shows Antoinette, the woman that had been Erica's guide. And, uh, I think there's a, I, you can see the actual painting in the back. I think it's one of his best works. I think it's really strong and really wonderful. And it gives a deeper sense of, look, of him looking into someone rather than just at them. I think you get a stronger sense of 
sort of penetration and observation than in almost any of his other images. So I think I'm going to stop there, and I wanted to get here, but I want to see if there are any questions, and then I want to give the last word to Erica and read you something that, that comes from one of her later publications. In the 1980s, Erica's anthropology became more and more focused on psychology and on women. By the 90s, she also was looking back at her own life through the lens of anthropology. And in the 90s, she returned to Vienna for the first time. And this is something that she wrote in an article about that trip and about memory in Vienna. She says, there are perhaps a number of aspects of my theoretical interests and orientations as an anthropologist that might be linked to this early experience that is her immigrant experience, of discontinuity and immigration, an interest in bilingualism or multilingualism, in cultural diversity, a need to grasp historical factors as well as cultural, structural, and psychological ones, a need for explanation rather than mere contemplation of cultural differences. And last, with respect to my own life and work, some sense of the fortuitous, of how one element in a sequence leads to another in often unpredictable or at least unpredicted ways. And I think what's remarkable to me is in part how true all of that is also for Paul um, in terms of his choice of art as something that um, allowed him to deal with his own experiences of dislocation, particularly through the wars. And, and that idea of the sense of the fortuitousness. The choice of anthropology, this is Eric again, the choice of anthropology as a field of study is itself relevant here. True, I was influenced by memorable teachers, but from my college years on, I came to see anthropology as a discipline that could help me stand back from my own experience and attempt to make sense of it. I don't know that Paul wanted to make sense of his experience through art, but it was a way that he could process it and find a way in his own paintings to enjoy a kind of liberation and freedom that um, you know was very different from what he had experienced in the war and and the sort of insular life that he lived in Columbus. He, in his later, he never left Columbus again, but he traveled the world in his paintings just as she traveled the world in her um, research and teaching and engagements with all of you. I can't begin to tell you 
how many notes and letters she collected through her lifetime, overflowing boxes and books of them, each thanking Erica Bourguignon for challenging them, for teaching them to think, for helping them to overcome, for answering a complaint with, what are you going to do to fix it? <laughs> For changing lives in significant ways, she changed the world. Thank you so much for coming. You know, each of you, what you meant to her. You know she cared for you and she wanted to connect you to others. How many times have we all heard her stories about each other? Because of her, we are all intertwined intertwined, and we always will be. You know, Erica had no patience for long, drawn-out speeches. So, in celebration of her and the connections, let's share memories tonight, one-on-one, -on, -one, on a personal level. Please channel her tonight as you try to meet as many people as you can at this gathering. Introduce yourself. Ask about relationships and history. Try to find commonalities and connections as good anthropologists do. But first, please raise your glass to honor Erica, our teacher, our mentor, our colleague, and our friend, to Erica. To Erica. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.